So today I'm going to talk a little bit about a use case that we have at Thomson Reuters. Um, and so I work for Thomson Reuters Special Services, which is a group that works with uh, state, federal, and local governments. Um, and we have, we've been using uh, a graph, uh, Neo4j is one of them, but we've been using graphs to solve problems for a number of years. Um, and what I want to talk to today about is a project that I've been on for a while where um, we index all the information that we have as a giant data company uh, in multiple different places so that our analysts and our subject matter experts can search um, and get the insights that they need. Um, and so today we're going to focus on how we do that with Neo4j and solar. And we'll talk about uh, some of the lessons that we've learned. And what I'm hoping is that if you are in the stage, if you're exploring what a graph can do for you, um, if you are in a space where know your customer is important, where understanding the flow of money is a big deal, um, or building a knowledge graph is something that's in your, your strategic goals, that hopefully something I say helps um, either spark, uh, spark a conversation with your colleagues um, or people in your organization. And please, please, please feel, re feel free to reach out. Um, I am a huge graph advocate, um, and I love talking about this stuff. So you can grab me um, during one of the breaks, introduce yourself. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about these things. Um, and I have found that um, coming to the, the Graph Connect and Graph Tour has enabled me to make relationships uh, that, that have helped our organization and other organizations because we've come across the same problems. Uh, so quick overview. I'm going to talk today about our environment, how we have everything set up. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the use case that we have and the goals we had in doing all of this, because um, a lot of work went into organizing uh, the information here, setting it up, and then serving it to different customers. I'm also going to talk about the outcomes, right? Not all of them were completely positive, and hopefully you can learn from some of the experiences that uh, we went through so that you don't make the same mistakes, um, and you can get from zero to done a lot faster. Um, so like I said, my name is Nathan Maines, and I work for Thomson Reuters Special Services. Um, I've been a user of Neo4j since 2015. Um, I've been coming to Graph Connect for the past few years, and I work on a project where we look at a knowledge graph that describes corporate supply chains and corporate hierarchies. Um, it serves as the backbone for a number of different applications that have very different views into that data. Uh, so over the next 40 minutes, we're going to go over that. And I'm going to hopefully talk about this problem uh, that I think is nearly universal, which is how do you search effectively uh, relationships in the real world? And we're going to talk about what we learned as we work towards solving it. So in 2017, Eric Poo gave this talk about the hierarchy of search needs. Right, this is a play on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I've found this to be an extremely helpful uh, infograph. Because whenever I talk with customers um, or stakeholders, they always say, uh, whatever they have, they want it to work like Google. And for us, you know, we are taking and parsing dozens of different data sets. Some of them are ours, and so we have a lot of control over them. Some of them are. Um, you know, commercial fee for service. So that's another professional data provider. So they may or may not be well structured. And then others are, these are the ones I like to call the fun data sets. Others are custom in house ones. So we have everything, um, you know, these can be really nice. These could be one individual who's been keeping notes on maybe a text, you know, notepad who's been keeping for 20 years and we need to actually do something with it. Um, they want to be able to search it all. Maybe they want images. Um, and one of the problems is getting all that data into the hands of subject matter experts who are going to do something with it. Uh, and so they always ask, 
hey, we've got all these you know, data silos, this big data lake. We just want it to work like Google. Can you do that? Um, and I usually say, you know, I would love to work on a search team that had the resources that Google Search has. But it looks like that's not happening today. So we're going to re we're gonna have to reframe the question that you've got. And what we end up doing um, is figuring out how searching works today. And so I've seen, you know, that could be somebody searching a file system. They're using Windows Explorer on, you know, Windows 95, and they're going through and looking at directories of files. That doesn't work really well when you're looking at images. It doesn't work really well when you're looking at locked PDFs, uh, but it's something that they're trying to do. Then I say, well, what is it, what's it going to take us to move to the next level, right? If we're down here at that search box level, because they're just doing a directory, what do we need to do in order to get Boolean and fuzzing search, pagination? What do we need to do to get there? Um, sometimes we've got customers who are pretty sophisticated, and so they may be looking at more contextual or predictive uh, search needs. And setting up our information in a graph uh, helps us get there helps us enrich the kinds of search uh, results that our subject matter experts want to see. It helps us get that into their hands. So, you know, to try and wake everybody up, get everybody involved, I just want to ask, what is your least favorite data format? I'm a data engineer. I work with a lot of really cool formats. I, look, I also work with a lot of really terrible ones. So this is, you know, your chance to shout your frustrations out. What's the format that you deal with uh, that's your least favorite? PDF. PDF. Okay, that's a good one. I figured we'd get some love for PDF. Um, any other ones? XML. XML. Okay. Latex source code. Oh, latex source code. Great. Yeah, that's a fun. That's fun. Uh, so there, are, you, everybody kind of has to deal with stuff that's not always clean. Um, I like this as my, this is my example. Like when I'm having a nightmare working with somebody's uh, information, I always go back to this. Back in, uh, what is this, like a year or two ago? Uh, yeah, 2016. The city of Detroit produced a lookup table uh, for its absentee precinct. Um, but the problem was, it was in Excel, but even worse, all the values were clip art. And so this was loads of fun, right? This, this, is, this is my nightmare. Um, and perhaps you share something like this, or you've, you've worked with data that makes about as much sense as this one does. So a lot of work goes in. The reason I talk about this is a lot of work goes into getting this information into a knowledge graph. And so let me talk a little bit about the scale of information that we're dealing with. So our knowledge graph currently we're processing, um, this is a little old, but we're processing a roughly 75 data sources. We've got a 1.7 billion triples in there. Um, and a triple, if you're not familiar with the way that RDF serializes data, is a statement. So it's a subject, a predicate, and an object. So basically a thing, its relationship to another thing. Um, we have over 18 million unique entities and we're leveraging seven different open source projects. A lot of what makes the backbone of our information um, kind of like puts that together is we have eight million officers and directors, their positions, um, and the companies that they're related to. We have over 10 million public and private companies, um, and those are all sitting on top of a multi-node cluster. Uh, we recommend five, so that, that'll make it fairly snappy. And it scales, so you can keep dumping information in there. So if you work for a company uh, that, say, has access to all of Reuters news content, you can continue to dump that into your, uh, into your data lake and not worry about running out of space. Uh, the really awesome news about this is that that data set with the officers and directors and companies is open. So there's no reason that you guys couldn't go out to permid.org, download it, and it's in RDF format, um, so it's in a graph, 
and process that, right? So if you need a really interesting POC and you are sitting there going, oh, I need some data, permid.org, you can go ahead and write that down. You can go and download it. It's a giant data set uh, that is real world. It has a bunch of information about people and companies. Um, and it contains information that, you know, buy and sell side traders are using every day. So our knowledge graph is a little bit smaller uh, scope. It's narrower in scope than, say, a knowledge graph like Google's, Microsoft's, Facebook's, IBM's. Um, we focus on business dealings. We focus on officers and directors and corporations. Um, I always like when people give certain statistics because you know people will throw around the word big data. Um, I like real numbers. So our current implementation and our current knowledge graph, when you run it in Neo, um, that index is about 60 gigabytes in size. And I will say, it's fairly snappy. So Cypher queries will come back pretty quickly, um, even for complex, you know, when you're doing matches, uh, complex queries, it'll come back and you'll get your results pretty quick. So let's talk about the process and what we do to get all of that really difficult to deal with data into a nice clean graph so that we can do interesting graph things with it. We go through these steps and we break it down into a mapping process, a stitching process, a tagging process, and finally our indexing phase. So the indexing phase is when Neo4j comes in and our other graph uh, databases. But before we can get there, we have to clean and prepare and then model the information. So what we start with is we start with our mapping stage. And this is where we unify data attributes into a common vocabulary across data sources. Uh, this can be a really difficult and time-consuming task. Um, and personally, this is where I like what certain things that RDF gives me, right? It allows me to place various mappings across my information with context-aware, uh, domain-specific or customer-centric modeling uh, without messing with the underlying entities. Uh, sometimes I bring this up and people are struggling to figure out why this is difficult. Uh, so I'm going to use an example. If I asked you how many countries there are in the world, what answer would you give me? Maybe you're an iPhone user. So you whip out your iPhone and you ask Siri. Well, I'll tell you what Siri will tell you. It'll say 206. Maybe you're an Android user. You ask Google Assistant, it's going to tell you 195. This was yesterday, so maybe they've updated it. But um, This should be an easy question, right? Now, this is where I get to the most controversial part of my talk, and perhaps the whole day. This is not an easy question. Uh, there happen to be political and other kinds of things going on in the world that make answering this kind of question really tricky. And it makes it specific to the domain that you're answering it in. So if I'm working with the United States government, I'm going to go to their officially defined list, and that's 195. Now, what do I do with countries like Taiwan? That's not on that list, but that's a country that, you know, if I asked you if that's a country, you'd probably say yes. Well, I need to put a different domain model specific uh, layer on there to help manage that. Um, this ends up being really tricky, and you might be sitting there saying, cool, Nathan, uh, enough with the semantics, right? A country's a country, like, I'm okay with some fuzzy details. I wish that you could be that okay with fuzzy details when we're talking about projects like this. Um, you'll have customers that have a totally different definition of something than you do. Uh, for example, you may be working with companies. I promise you, the banks in this room, people who work at banks, you all think about companies slightly differently. Um, they could be a legal entity, depends on what country they're registered in. Uh, they could be maybe an individual that has a trust set up. And it could just be, maybe you call them a customer. Um, everybody thinks about these things a little bit differently. Sometimes we turn to outside organizations to find our definitions, right? So for our country example, perhaps we're looking at uh, the state must have 
this is the Monteviedo Convention of 1933. It says a state has to have permanent population, defined territory, a government, and a capacity to enter into relations with other states. That definition still doesn't help me. Uh, what do we do when we have a, a, you know, a, not, a nation state that's big and powerful but doesn't have a geographical border? But we want to model relationships with them. We've got to be domain aware. Um, and so this ends up being tricky. And this is where mapping comes into play. This is important for us to get it right, um, but be flexible enough to handle some of the ambiguities in the real world. But good news is, once you get all that done, now you can move on to the fun stuff. You can start to stitch things together. So we can take the entry from all of our countries in different data sources and start representing them as a single entity with different pointers. This, if any of you are used to uh, traditional data warehousing, and maybe you've been working with, um, I don't know, I won't say any names, but certain companies that do like big data warehouses and you're doing complex joins and they go on for days, right? This is where that starts to be really useful because you'd have to create another table with another ID that points to all the other IDs you care about but in our graph, we just have our single entity that provides that view and gives us adjacency lookups so that we can go and look at any of those uh, connected nodes. And the nice thing is that that connection has a relationship, so we also know what kind of connection it is. Um, but spoiler alert, these definitions, once you get them all ironed out, they're going to change. They're going to keep changing as the customers, the stakeholders come back, and they talk to you about their needs. Um, so be aware for that and, and include that in your process. In our country example, less than 1% of our entities have a status called the official observer. These are countries uh, that the UN recognizes as sovereign states, but they are not allowed to vote in the UN General Assembly. But they are allowed to participate and to observe and be there. Pretty important flag that we need to track, but it's on two nation states. So in our small trivial example, right, we're talking about less than 1% of all of our data. Um, we need to track that. That's a pretty sparsely populated column or an, an additional relational table. But in the graph, guess what? You just have two relationships, and that's all the space it takes. You don't have to worry about it. If that changes, you just add new ones, and that's fine. Uh, so these models allow us to represent relationships in the real world that are much more ambiguous than columns and rows. Uh, and important, you don't want to be the person who makes a mistake by calling somebody, a representative of a country, say, wait a second, you're not in my database. You're not a country. Uh, that's a big mistake. Um, just I'm giving that tip out for free. Don't do it. So next step, we go into tagging, right? And this is something that we've been doing for a long time um, as we process a lot of unstructured uh, text, right? Reuters publishes uh, thousands of documents every day, uh, thousands of stories, and, some of the, and they do add some structure to that, um, but not the structure that necessarily I want or my customers want. So this is where we, we bring in uh, the capability to tag and extract relationships and entities. Um, the key piece here is being able to resolve those entities as you extract them to something other than just the document. So you want to have your graph that stores these stitched views of entities. And you want to have that so that when you're tagging in an ideal world, you're bringing it back to your model. So you know that the Boeing that shows up in the document is the Boeing related to ID number 123 in your graph. You want to know that the relationship that those two companies have is the same relationship that you've seen before so that you can manage and maintain that. Now, this is a difficult problem. Um, and I think is one of those areas that there's still quite a bit of growth. Uh, but this is something that we do. So we'll process uh, not just Reuters content, but other unstructured content. We'll tag, we'll extract entities, resolve those, and then we create a, kind of a relationship validation, if you will, by inserting a relationship 
and a document to back that relationship up. This is a process that we have um, that's semi-supervised. We have uh, machine learning models that run and extract information, but we also have humans um, and analysts in the loop that'll go back in um, and validate those and make sure that you know, they, they spot check, they do some QA work for us. And so this part, even when you're processing loads and loads of unstructured content, you also need to do stuff that's not as fancy. You just need to do some, set up some simple filters. Maybe I don't need to know about um, the latest tennis, the ATP events that are coming up for tennis, right? I don't need to store all those documents in my graph because my graph is watching, say, mergers and acquisitions between companies. So I don't necessarily care about tennis and who's winning or even soccer. Now, that gets tricky because I may care about who's buying or selling a soccer team um, or even who's sponsoring the ATP. But that's where your filters come in, right? That's where you get to use your brain and think about how you're going to split up some of that information so that you put it in the right spot. You validate the right kinds of relationships. The other ones you store, um, but you don't want to necessarily bring those into your graph. Because what you don't want to do is make your pristine graph with all of its nice traversals just a big muddy mess where your graph traversals are bringing back hundreds of thousands of documents about Serena Williams when what you're trying to find are mergers and acquisitions uh, between a targeted set of companies. Finally, what we end up doing right is we index this all. So indexing allows us to search all of this information. Um, and so you may be used to using relational databases to do this or having an application that sits on top of relational databases to bring back information. But we all have been frustrated by search results that don't read our minds. Right? Maybe we're using fuzzy matching. Maybe we're using some Boolean. We're getting fancy, and our query is you know, 200, 300 characters long. We've got a lot of XOR symbols, parentheses, ands, uh, but we're still missing stuff. That's where our index comes in. We want to make this searchable for any kind of analyst. Be it somebody who's skilled in Cypher, we want to give it to them so that they can run their Cypher queries and find the kinds of relationships they need to do. Maybe they need to do community detection, centrality measurements. Great, Cypher lets them do that. We also want to support maybe somebody who's new and they just want to type in things, right? They just want the Google experience. They want to type in some words and hope that relevant stuff comes back. Um, that's where our index comes in and the choices that we make about where that information lives uh, starts to matter. And in our case, we, put, uh, we have solar for some of the free text Lucene searching um, that lets us just cruise through free text documents. Uh, we also have NEO, which we use uh, to do community detection, network centrality, um, and use some other fancy graph algorithms uh, that are actually written about in that book that you can pick up at the registration desk. Um, and they're really nice, right? I'm sure there are a lot of smart people in this room. It's really nice, even if you are that smart, to not have to write all the graph algorithms. Um, they exist in the NEO library, and so you can start using them in your project almost immediately, uh, which is awesome. And so once we do all of this, right now we have a searchable index that our subject matter experts can begin to gain insights from. They can begin to find the things that they're looking for and the things that those uh, entities are connected to. So that's where this starts to change. So let me show you a little bit about how our architecture is set up. Um, this is just, this isn't the right answer. It happens to be a right answer. It works for us. And so what we've got is this whole stack that helps manage the resources of our computers um, and our servers and then serve those up to a user and a customer. Over here on the side in our gray box, that's where we put the different kinds of indexes that we may want to use. So in this example, right, we have Neo4j over there. Um, which a user could access either directly or through a, an end web application, an end user web application. 
We also provide an API uh, that allows them to come in and call specific functions so that API users or developers on our team have access to the network's information and other kinds of um, analysis tools uh, that they can build in and bake into their applications. The nice thing about breaking things down this way is we allow data to come in in basically any format that we can parse. So we take CSV, we take RDF uh, relational databases as long as they have a driver, uh, web service responses, so give me JSON, give me SOAP, give me whatever goofy thing you can think of. As long as, we can, as long as it's something that we can parse, we can build a map for it. Um, and then XML, right? We can take that in and, and parse those relationships too. All of, this ends up, all of this ends up serving the end user so that the users can go and find what they need to find. So one of the questions that I end up getting is why do we use both? And like I've been hinting at, we like to use things uh, that are good at certain tasks for the tasks that they're good at. We happen to have the luxury to split that apart and we have a number of uh, experts in-house who can do different things with, say, RDF. Or we have experts who are really good at writing cipher queries. Um, so we just want to be able to show them the information in a format that they're comfortable with because ultimately we're solving a search problem. We're helping them go across all the information that we have in our data lake. Um, another major advantage that we have is we decouple that searching layer from the storage layer so that our storage can grow and do whatever it needs to do. We can make tweaks to the search um, without having to worry about what's stored underneath. So that just keeps scaling, just keeps getting bigger. We have an archive schedule if we need it. Um, and that just, it doesn't affect or impact our end users. We also, you know, we want to be able to leverage the kinds of query languages that people are familiar with. Um, so Cypher is great, Sparkle is great, GraphQL. Uh, we'll support as many of those as we can. We want to leverage algorithms written by, uh, written by and reviewed by multiple people. So the Neo4j graph algorithm library lets us do that. And we also want to perform domain-specific modeling. Again, when we build those indexes, what we want to do is give an index to a customer in the way that they need it. So if, a, if I call something a company and another customer calls them a customer, we want to be able to provide them that context and that domain-specific modeling so that they can go in and feel comfortable in ultimately the same data model that sits underneath. So let me talk a little bit about the RDF to Neo mapping. Um, there, I know that we have a talk later today uh, where you, if this is something that's interesting to you, they'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, but here's some, this is the basic stuff. And the only reason I'm showing you this is I want you to understand how easy it is, right? There are ways you can optimize this and get better, but the basic steps are pretty straightforward. We iterate over all of our relationships that exist in RDF. Then we just go and look at each node, and we match it to all of its nodes that, are, that it's connected to. And then finally, we do some merging, right? We merge all those paths with the, the relationships that matter. Now, this is the, the tricky part. This is where you create a map so that you can collapse relationships on top of each other if you need to, or leave them as verbose as you want. Um, and one of the things that you've got to deal with when you're dealing uh, across data sets, especially in RDF, is you're going to have different ontologies that are, exist inside your, inside your data. And so you may need to make choices about how you're going to map those and manage those, but that's up to you. And by doing this process and kind of separating it out, it allows you to play with it um, where you're not blowing away your entire data store uh, over and over and over again. You're just dealing with the index. Um, so some things that you know, are worth shouting out uh, and mentioning. This procedure that we have, uh, roughly 500 lines of Java code, and we're able to do that straight into Neo. And um, even here at Graph Tour, 
I found out that I can get that even shorter and we can make that even more compact by using stored procedures that sit on the server and um, compile those. We don't have to write or generate cipher queries to do inserts. Um, this, the process runs fairly quickly uh, and it's pretty straightforward to troubleshoot. So you're not talking about having a ton of domain knowledge about say the Neo driver to get up and, and running. This is something that you know, your, your developers would be able to look at and, and start making an impact right away, start squashing bugs or doing anything like that. Um, shout out to the unwind function in Cypher. Uh, that's a lifesaver. We use a lot of you know, match statements. Um, and then the merge paths, uh, again, that's a, your opportunity to build a map and merge those relationships in a way that makes sense for you. So let's get to something a little bit more interesting. Um, not that that wasn't just riveting to all of you, but let's talk about use cases, right? When I come to these and to these kinds of events, I want to see how people are using the technology or the techniques that everybody's talking about in the wild. So I'm going to show you three, uh, I think three, that we've got that I think are pretty cool. And like I said, we'll have a question for a Q. We'll have some Q&A time here at the end. And um, I'm happy to field some questions about it. And if you have more specific ones, please find me um, and, and we can talk about it. So one of the things that we do is we've got to support different kinds of use cases. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, think about it, right? We, we may have some know your customer style use cases. We may have some supply chain risk use cases. Um, and those, the way that we present that information is going to be a little bit different for everybody, especially when we put in the domain specific language that different customers are going to need. And so the first one that I'm going to talk about is one that I'm really, uh, that I really like. And one of the inspirations for this was um, if you've ever been on IMDB um, and if you like movies or you like websites and you go and check out uh, IMDB, they have a, a, a section called the star meter. Um, are any of you familiar with that? Okay. The star meter lets you know who is popular that week in the realm of movies. Um, and it shows you a ranking. So you may have a big movie star that just came out with a new movie, and they will move up. And you'll be able to look at their star meter ranking. Perhaps you've noticed it on their page. Um, and it'll show you not just their ranking, say, um, it, it shows you their ranking relative to all the other people in the database. Um, and it changes fairly regularly. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to take that much further and be able to target things that I actually need to care about instead of just movie stars and how popular they are. And so what we did is we used graph centrality algorithms to help us compute, uh, you know, essentially page rank or some small variant of that on targeted populations. So think of this as your customer portfolio. Think of this as um, you could do this with anything, right? You could do this with the network of people that play in the Premier League. Um, and you could see who the most influential players were or who the most influential companies were. Um, but you would be able to facet that down um, from a single search display without recomputing everything. And so what we end up doing here is, you know, on the, the top left with our most influential box, we keep just the network centrality, right? You can think of this, this one's pretty close to Google PageRank. So you're looking at who the major players, in, and in this case, we're looking at industries, who the major players are. And then we can filter that down further by geography um, or a handful of other facets. That one's interesting, but when you're working with subject matter experts who are in the space that you're talking about, right? We're working with somebody who is all about the oil industry in Egypt. They know who all the major players are. They don't need that panel. What they need is what we've got over here in the, it's kind of in the center, but our biggest movers. And this is computed centrality with a timestamp, right? This is something where you can see who has shifted the most 
and they can then drill down on the events that have helped that particular entity become more or less, we have the, the inverse, less influential in the given time span. Um, that ends up being really, really good for any kind of targeting uh, exercise you're going to do. If you need to learn about your customer supply chain, if you need to learn about, say, an industry that you're a little unfamiliar with, you can go in and drill into the big movers and shakers. You can also look at people that have been added or dropped from your networks. So if you have a network that, you know, this is something that you might be thinking, well, I'm watching 100 people. That's not too hard to keep track of. In this particular example, right, we're watching close to 20,000 entities. And we want one or two analysts to be able to monitor that uh, so that they can help notify customers who are interested in the movement within those spaces. This helps them find the things that they need to look into or learn a little bit more about in order to help the customer stay informed of happenings in an industry that they're particularly interested in. So this is, and then of course we provide the graph view so that they can click and look at the relationships and there's a visual that they can generate PowerPoint slides with, right? So this is really cool. I like this. Um, like I said, I'd like to remake this for IMDB so that they have something a little bit fancier than just like page views, but that's another, that's another conference talk. The other use case that we have is we do this relationship validation between, uh, via the automated document processing. So we go through and we read a ton of content, right? And Reuters and other uh, news providers that we partner with, we'll go through and read those, those documents and extract relationships and entities out of those documents. That allows us to watch relationships in near real time uh, develop so they can wane, they can ebb and flow. You can watch, uh, you can move your time series uh, to, to look at, say, three months in the past, and I want to look at how certain relationships changed for the six months prior to that. And then you want to move that window and just keep chunking by week into the future. That's something that you can do uh, by looking at these relationship validations and this automated document tagging. And I've saved, of course, the best for last. Uh, and this is one where we take all the investment data that we have, and we model it in our graph, and then we figure out cool things that we can do with that. And so in this particular use case, um, you know, I, haven't, I have yet to be in a demo or a sales meeting where somebody doesn't say, you know what would be cool? Put it on a map. <laughs> and so to preempt that, you know what would be cool? We put it on a map. Um, and something interesting happened. We were cruising through and uh, looking at, you know, some of my hobbies, like Russian mining. Just looking at the activity in that industry. And what we ended up seeing was what I first thought was a mistake. We ended up seeing that a lot of money from Florida was flowing into a particular uh, Russian mining company. Now this was something that, you know, as a, as a developer, not uncommon, where I went, oh man, we missed the decimal spot, or that's not the right entity. But digging into this a little bit more, I wasn't the only person that noticed this. Right around the same time, uh, the Rolling Stone published this really interesting article about a certain teacher, firefighter, police, other retirement funds going into sanctioned Russian companies, which raised a number of questions and then was quickly forgotten because our president tweeted something uh, that captivated the news cycle. But anyway, this is, this is the kind of insight that we can get when we structure our data in a graph and we do it in a way that supports these use cases. Um, and for the current environment, um, if, if you're following, Right there is a new wave of sanctions for certain Turkish companies, and that's this week. I would have gone in and made an updated slide, um, which would not have been too hard. It just, I ran out of time. Um, and I'm sure you'd find interesting things about other pension funds going to places that are newly sanctioned, because overnight, it became not okay to give them money. 
So to wrap up, next steps, right? This is where I invite you, as somebody who's interested in the graph community, to do something. We've got entity resolution is still a big problem. If you know anything about it, you have any good ideas, jump on board. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and last year, the big tech companies identified this as an area where we have uh, room to improve, to move towards a supervised or an unsupervised learning method for tagging and resolving entities. Open identifiers. Uh, using them in, the, in your own data sets will help other people use them. Um, so just a handful to mention, PermID, uh, graph or grid.ac, Wikidata, Freebase, um, and JSTOR topic codes. Those are a handful of open IDs that I use and I find very helpful. Um, and then promoting graph literacy. So here's something I'd like to invite everybody to do. You're here at Graph Tour. Uh, and you're going to receive a ton of information, no matter what stage you're in, I'd invite you to become a graph advocate. And you can do this by either writing a blog post about something that you've done in graph, with using graphs. You can write a blog post about cool things you've learned that graphs can do. Or you can become somebody at your organization that champions graph causes. And I think that's something that everybody in here can do uh, and will help us get to a better stage uh, with our ecosystem. I'd just like to thank the open source projects. Uh, open, I like to be an open source advocate. These are open source projects that have been invaluable to our process and the things that we are doing and the problems we're solving. And so if you don't use any of these or you're unfamiliar, please check them out. Right? We have Zookeeper, Tomcat, Postgres, Accumulo, Solar, Redis, Neo4j, and Hadoop, all excellent projects. Um, and I just invite you, right, with your becoming a graph advocate, feel free. Talk to your colleagues. If you're here by yourself or you're the only person at your organization who is into this, please feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Nathan Maines. Um, and I hope to hear about your, your uh, adventures in graphs. Thank you.